What is the greatest poop show you have ever witnessed? Story 1. My second cousin's wedding. Everyone has a white trash branch of their family tree. This is part of mine. Let's start with the invitations. Hand delivered to the people in the same towns or surrounding to save on stamps. The other family members didn't get invitations mailed, though. A few days before the wedding, they created a Facebook invitation, and it was clear that this was because they only got a minimal amount of responses back and needed a more accurate count. Many people commented that they had no idea. The wedding was in a park under a big tent next to a shelter with picnic tables. It was October outside in the Chicago area. It was snowing, of course. My family got there early and immediately realized this was going to be a weird white trash slash Korean mixed wedding. We had only met the bride once or twice, not a close part of the family, and all we knew was that she was Korean. We didn't know she was first generation American. The bride was standing in the parking lot directing people. Everyone huddled in plastic folding chairs for the wedding. The colors of the wedding were camouflage and hunter's orange. Groomsmen wore camo vests with their tuxedos, and bridesmaids wore bright orange dresses. The music for the ceremony was a cousin manning an iPod poorly with no practice. Skip to the reception under the pavilion. The cake was piles of grocery store cupcakes on the sides. The meal was a buffet of cut raw vegetables with Costco bottles of ranch, ice-cold pasta casserole, and fruit trays. Then there was a homemade odd Korean barbecue. It was like mystery meat, and the family members that were serving it didn't say what it was. It was also cold, and there was no way to keep anything warm. Open bar had open coolers of canned beer and handles of booze. They hired someone to try and serve, but it just ended up being someone to pour the shots. Post-ceremony dancing, again on the iPod, until it fell from the top of the speaker and broke. I stepped in with my phone and a paid Spotify account. As wedding coordinator at a country club, I know what songs would get people up, and it wasn't an hour of Rat Pack songs. It was about this time that I realized that there is no photographer. I set up a couple cute photo ops, but they were lost on these people. I would guess that more than 50% of the wedding guests left right after lunch. 25% were trying to make the most of it by dancing and drinking, while the last 25% were foraging the woods looking for stuff to burn in the outdoor fireplace. Did I mention it was freezing cold? No heaters provided. Three walls to the tent. Blustery winds. The only saving grace of this wedding was the drunk groomsmen who snuck full bottles of booze into the trunk of my car towards the end of the night. The next day, the bride said on Facebook that it was the wedding of her dreams, so at least she was happy. Story 2. It didn't happen today, but it's still a good story. I work in a bike shop. It's nothing special, not a boutique or anything like that. Imagine a mom and pop sort of shop. Now imagine that this shop, A, has no air conditioning, and B, it's mid-July in Wisconsin with a humidity of 80%. So it's a busy day on the floor. Our salesmen are working on selling, building, repairing bikes, etc. This middle-aged gentleman walks in, slightly hunched over, maybe a buck eighty, two hundred pounds. He's got kind of a scrunched face and a balding head. Anyways, he walks in and practically grabs me by the shirt. This was the exchange. Sir, sir, can I use your restroom, please? It's urgent. Having never been confronted with a grown man asking for the bathroom, urgently, I said sure. Mistake number one. Mistake number two was getting this man to the bathroom in time. Fast forward about 15 minutes, the man gets out of the bathroom and waddles into the front. At this point, I've forgotten about him. He approaches me, the only one kind enough to talk to him and rescue him, I guess, and says, and I can't make this up, don't be embarrassed. What that meant, I still have no idea to this day. It wasn't the cryptic message that this man had left that was the first clue that I had indeed made a grave error in letting him use our restroom. It was the smell. I don't know how he did it, but that man had managed to spray liquid fecal matter over a large majority of the bathroom. By a large majority, I mean from stem to stern, it was covered in crap. The only conclusion that I can come to is that this man dropped his pants much less than fast enough. At T-3 seconds, not facing the toilet, these are my CSI skills coming into play, he began his crap fuel descent to the seat. At T-2 seconds, there was a catastrophic O-ring failure, and the fuel tanks began dumping everything. At T-3 seconds, there must have been at least one cubic meter of crap erupting from this man's butthole. At T-5 seconds, the 180 degree turn had been completed, and he was finally sitting down but the damage was done. One wall, caked in crap, 
One toilet seat caked in crap. Even the toilet was caked in crap. And the smell. My God, the smell. Remember the 80% humidity and mid-July? It was 94 degrees. We had to do a short-term evacuation of the shop. EMS was called. Emergency services arrived. Long story short, it was a mess. I'll never forget that, though. I'll never forget what the man said. If I ever have a Challenger disaster, I will keep his words near and dear to my heart. Don't be embarrassed. Godspeed, you brave pooper. Godspeed. Too long didn't read. Challenger exploded in craptastrophe in my bathroom. Posted this before, but it fits. Story 3. I was in Walmart once. I know what you're thinking. Ooh-wee! This is how they all start. And you're right. So my girlfriend and I are buying stuff for our new apartment, and there are these kids in the sports aisles across the little aisle highway thingy playing with a football. Kids being kids. One was, I don't know, 13-ish, and the other was younger, maybe 8 or 9. Well, the litter of the chutes tosses the football a little too high to his older brother, and it knocks over some boxes on the top shelf of the aisle behind them. Immediately, a large man screams bloody murder from that side of the aisle. The two kids freeze and look at each other for some sort of direction as to what to do. They decide to see what happens. I walk over there too, telling my girlfriend that I'm looking for something in the next aisle. This is where it gets good. Well, the box that fell was in the fishing and hunting aisle, and it fell right through the display case where all the knives are, shattering the glass and lodging some shards in this poor old man's hands. He is furious, and dementia-ridden, I'm pretty sure. The kids are too late to run. As soon as they round the corner with their guilty-looking faces, he knew. Oh, he knew. So he chased them, slowly. He's an old man. He can't run very fast. Okay, he hobbled. The kids start to run, right as the boy's mom comes over to check on her brats, who run right by her. Old man, shardy hands, shards still in his hands, tries to stop short, but couldn't, so he put his hands up to brace himself, slicing open the mom. She had cuts on her hands, face, shoulders, and even got some shards in herself, too. Well, she fell over, and the kids were gone, and the old man is confused, and security comes to fix the situation. I'm reeling. Long story short, it took three security guards to get a hold of the old man's shard hands, because he insisted he doesn't need help, swatting his shards at the guards when they tried to get close. EMTs came shortly after and told us bystanders to get the F out. Never change, Walmart. Old man shardy hands, shards still in hands, I love you. Story 4. I was at LAX on November 22nd when a car crash near my terminal was mistaken for gunfire, prompting a mass panic and evacuation of the entire airport. At the time, I was sitting at my gate waiting for boarding. I saw a uniformed woman run by, looked like she worked somewhere at one of the stores. She was being chased by someone else in the same uniform. I thought to myself, <laughs> that's cute, two airport employees playing tag in the airport for whatever reason. Three seconds later, I hear yelling and about a million people ran behind them and it made sense. I picked up my bags and began walking to the nearest exit trying to keep my head. There was tons of screaming and a lot of people dearling in the headlights. I must have passed about 50 people just lying in piles on the floor with their luggage. Hiding? Not really sure what their plan was, as we were about 20 yards from a very clearly marked exit. After pointing it out to as many of them as I could, I exited, and we waited a bit before they let us back into the same terminal. Still, no one knew what had happened, and moments after being let back in, a squad of armored officers with rifles ran through screaming bloody murder for everyone to get on the floor. After another hour or so, we were all evacuated back to security screening, probably because they let thousands of people back into the terminal after the original panic was rescreening. Going through the security check again took like four hours, with crowds of people as far as I could see in every direction. LAX was a layover for me. My delayed flight still took off without me, and I had to sleep on the floor of LAX Terminal 4 till the next flight out in the morning. It was quite an experience. Seeing so many people crap on the bed during the panic was a real eye-opener. To be fair, I believe this was a couple weeks after the TSA shooting there. Story 5 I've told this story before, but it was a pretty good poop show. The first wedding I ever went to was just a raging disaster. I didn't even know the couple. The groom was a friend of the guy I was dating, so I got dragged along as the plus one. The wedding was out on a golf course in summer, so it was hotter than heck out there. We wait, and we wait, 
and we wait some more, and I start thinking maybe the bride ran off. Then this white limo comes flying up the drive and literally screeches to a halt, burning off some tire. Turns out the limo company forgot to pick up the bride. It's two hours later than it should have been at this point when we finally get started, so the sun's going down. Naturally, people do what they do and start taking pictures. And that's when the maid of honor hits the floor and has a grand mal seizure because the flashes set her off. So they call an ambulance and carry on with the ceremony, which was really awkward because the paramedics are there with this poor girl, and the bride is saying her I do's and keeps looking over and shouting, Tracy, I love you. I hope you're okay. I have no idea if her name was Tracy or not. I gave up and went home after the ceremony because it was late and I had stuff to do. The guy I was dating stayed for the reception though. According to him, the bride's mother got completely poop-faced drunk and started screaming that her daughter's wedding had been ruined. So she turned over the table with all the gifts on it and stomped on as many of them as she could. It's a pity because I'm sure the couple were nice people that just had terrible luck. But when I think of poop shows, that's the one that comes to mind first. Story 6. When I was in high school, I went to a house party on a really bad side of town. It ended up being pretty lousy, so we decided to leave and started heading home at around 2 or 3 a.m. About 5 minutes into the car ride home, and I was mere seconds away from peeing my pants. In a panic, I asked my ride to pull over ASAP. We pulled into this super sketchy 24-hour Walgreens in a notoriously ghetto neighborhood. But I didn't even care, because if I had waited any longer, I would have peed in the passenger seat. I ran inside and the cashier had to walk me to the back and unlock the bathroom for me. I finished and exited the bathroom and the cashier was standing by the door so he could lock it. He locks the bathroom door and we both start walking back to the front of the store. We get about midway through the store when this woman stops him and starts yelling about needing him to unlock the glass case with the at-home paternity tests in it. So he follows her to the other corner of the store and I keep walking straight making my way towards the door. I get outside and there's an old crappy Chevy Trailblazer parked by the door. Not in a parking spot, by the door, literally parked on the sidewalk slash curb in front of the doors. Inside are four or five guys screaming at each other. At first I couldn't really tell what they were saying because they were all yelling over each other. Then I heard it. Y'all know that baby ain't mine, I only ever put it in her butt. Nah, you know you can still get her pregnant if you put it in the butt. Story 7 had an agent in our office. His real name is Steve. After this story, we call him Poop Pants. One beautiful sunny California day, my secretary came to me with a stupefied look on her face. She tells me that Steve got out of his car, ran to the bathroom, then left the building in a hurry while shouting there's a problem in the bathroom that needs attention. And being the leader of the office, it was up to me to check it out. The walkway to the bathroom has a dark pebble tech floor, so it really wasn't my fault I couldn't make out what the piles of brown matter every foot leading into the bathroom were. Opening the door, I was greeted by an unholy sight. The flooring in the bathroom is linoleum, white linoleum. Here's when I start to realize the piles are crap, and they're getting larger. I'm not sure why, if it was an inner voice looking for answers, or just stupid curiosity, I open the stall door and open what I would describe as Van Gogh's starry night in crap. All over the place. The walls, toilet, and floor were covered. Poop Pants had decided to try and get some work done before his colonoscopy, and apparently didn't realize he had just drunk a gallon of Miralax. This was the day that I truly understood how important janitors are and will teach my kids to always give them the respect they deserve. How important a janitor is as a woman who's worked at several companies with other ladies who didn't understand proper hygiene or freaking human decency. I always treat the janitors extra nicely. It works out well. They like me and usually answer any request quickly. But yes, they often get treated like subhuman and it ticks me off. Story 8. I kind of invoked the crap show by sharing an extremely innocent link on my mom's Facebook wall. It was a link to the Bath & Body's Christmas air freshener sale, and this particular one was shaped like a snowman. My mom loves snowmen. Anyway, my uncle has about 10,000 screws loose in his brain and does crazy crap constantly. But this one has to be the craziest crap show ever. My uncle kept commenting on the post of the snowman air freshener about how air fresheners are bad for your health, and that's why there are so many gay and trans people in the world. 
He claimed the air freshener produces pheromones that turn fish into hermaphrodites and that they have effects on the human brain. My mom kept telling me this crap was crazy, but he kept going on and on about it. Meanwhile, my gay sister is witnessing this entire thing, and she's getting more and more ticked off by the minute. She's an amazing writer, so she wrote a long, thought-out post about what my uncle was saying. Of course, this ticked off my uncle, and he kept insulting my sister, saying that she's only gay because she's too fat for any man to love her, and including misinterpretations of Bible quotes. I deleted the post, but he ended up messaging my sister, going on and on about how her lifestyle is wrong until she finally blocked him. We didn't talk to him for a really long time, and he ended up going to counseling for a brief time. So he wrote a long, thought-out apology to both my mom and sister. Unfortunately, he stopped going to counseling, and he's back to his bat-crap crazy self. Luckily, he moved to California now. Good thing there's no gay people there. Story 9. St. Andrew's Hall, downtown Detroit, year 2000, after buying a pre-sale ticket to an electronic show and waiting outside in the freezing cold for two hours, we left, only to discover a back door and just walked right in. There were drugs everywhere, which isn't that strange, but I mean, people were shooting up and snorting off any flat surface they could find. One addict looked like he was passed out on the floor. Other people were barfing everywhere. All this is going on among about a thousand people dancing and raving. I see a couple fights break out, three people get carried out while completely passed out and obviously ODing on drugs, people doing it with each other on the dance floor, and then all of a sudden, all the lights come on and the entire place is flooded by DEA and ATF agents with automatic weapons drawn. They weren't shouting instructions, so I just bolted the F out of there and into the freezing cold parking lot. Earlier in the night, I told my friends that if crap went down, we were to meet at a specific lamppost in the parking lot. They made fun of me for acting like their mom, but sure enough, everyone in the group ended up there and we left immediately to go to an after party. I assure everyone this did actually happen. I remember it very vividly because it's the only time I've ever had a gun pointed at me. St. Andrew's Hall varies a lot based on what the promoter is putting on the show. When you said electronics show, I thought you meant an electronics trade show and I was confused about why so many people would be shooting up drugs there. Story 10. Let me tell you about the time I had the cops called on me for poor telephone etiquette. So my boss at the time didn't work on site, preferring to check in with the supervisors by telephone. She got us into some financial trouble by signing a contract that we basically couldn't fulfill under the conditions she refused to change, so she was being a bit more hands-on than usual. At this point, she was calling the office regularly to do things like spend an hour lecturing the site manager about how we weren't working fast enough, or ask if somebody was late because it was 15 minutes into their shift, and she noticed they hadn't logged into their timesheet slash roster website. It was somewhat stressful. She'd regularly interfere in the system set up for quality control by personally calling people to demand explanations for errors. Anyway, we were all pretty intimidated by her phone calls, so when a pay dispute came up, those of us involved decided to send her an email about it. She insisted on responding with a phone call, though. We were kind of scared of getting fired, so we decided to ask to record the phone call, so everything was, you know, on the record. Reader, she flipped the frick out. She not only refused to be recorded, but she also then refused to speak with us, asking for the phone to be given to the supervisor and telling the supervisor to eject us from the building. When we said we wanted written confirmation of whether we were fired or not before we left, she decided we were occupying the building and called the police, who were deeply baffled by the whole affair, incidentally. Story 11. Just wrote this, but it totally fits. One of my brothers had a poop storm of a wedding, announced they were pregnant right before the ceremony, stealing their own thunder, had it outdoors at this strange country club place, I don't know how to describe what it was, but they did not seem to understand how to do a wedding. It was windy, they had the ceremony outside, chairs and other things blew away. They invited around a hundred people, they had around half the people not bother to show up after RSVPing. The desserts, besides the wedding cake, never showed up, which worked out I guess with the number of people who were missing. He asked me to give a speech, just like called me up to say a few words without any warning, after telling me my daughter wasn't allowed at the wedding because it was no children, which I might have understood had they not allowed the maid of honor and the bride's sister to each bring their children as exceptions, one newborn, one a few months older than my daughter. Turned out I wasn't the only one asked to give a speech without being warned. 
my other brother gave an epic speech. He just said, I'm a cop, and if your relationship was a car on the highway, I'd give you a speeding ticket and say, slow down, because you're going too freaking fast. And then he sat back down. They were divorced before they made it to one year. Good thing your older brother could dispatch medical code 3 to deal with the burn victim. Story 12. Flying 5.30 a.m. flight Houston through Dallas after a night of margaritas and heavy-duty jalapeno queso, I realize, man, I've got a poop storm brewing. Land in Dallas, and it's the Friday morning rush. Restrooms are packed. I mean, cheek to flapping jowl. Three deep, waiting for a stall. My cheeks are clenched tighter than Fort Knox, knowing what's coming. Finally getting into the stall, the storm breaks with a massive microburst, burning everything it touches. Wipe, wipe, then guts gurgle and another burning drip. Spatter, wipe, repeat. Finally, the end seems in sight. I become aware the bowl below me is so full of paper, it's almost touching my butt. Suddenly, the auto flush triggers. The wad of paper goes down and then clogs. The fluid level starts rising. What should I do? Should I shout out a warning? Time is of the essence. I grab my pants up, buckle my belt, snatch my computer bag, and bolt out the door just as the sewage starts pouring over the edge of the bowl. Dashing into the dense crowd, I hope no one can ID me as the perp. Behind me, the doors of the two adjacent stalls burst open. A guy with his pants around his knees is hopping out, dragging his bag. On the other side, a guy leaps out with toilet paper steamers hanging from his butt, leapfrogging out of his stall. The crowd outside is still cheek to jowl. He falls over into the crowd. People go down like bowling pins. I hear screams behind me over the sound of water pouring on the tiles. Run. Don't look back. Story 13. I posted this as a response to a thread a while back, and I guess I'll post it again here. It was a pleasant winter morning, and the bright sun shone down upon us kids on the playground. We sixth graders had settled into our customary four-square game, in which the class annoyance, call him Brendan, was the server, and relentlessly targeted this other kid, for the purposes of this story, call him Jake. Eventually, Jake eliminated Brendan with an insanely lucky shot, which then caused Brendan to break down wailing, altogether not an uncommon occurrence, that Jake was targeting and bullying him, even though the opposite was true. As the outbursts were all too common with Brendan, we laughed it off, until I saw him on the phone as I used the bathroom after recess. Fifteen minutes later, his mom shows up in our classroom and launches an unbelievably profane tirade at both Jake and the teacher, who really didn't know what was going on, as she wasn't the recess monitor. The mom then grabbed Brendan's arm, told him to get his bags together, and Brendan was no longer seen again at the school. However, to make things more awkward, Brendan's younger sister still attended the school and would be picked up daily by their mom. Sometimes, Brendan himself would come to school and walk home with his sister, which would create an unbelievably awkward situation. As soon as he or his mom walked onto campus, the usual elementary school banter would transition into whispering and stares of fright from the population of the school. Story 14. New Year's Eve, quite a few years ago. My oldest daughter, then five years old, was staying up till midnight for the first time, foreshadowing. She spent the whole evening basically sucking down soda and shoving chips, etc. into her mouth. Right after the ball dropped, she fell asleep on the couch, so I picked her up to take her upstairs. I've got my arms under her butt, and she has hers around my neck, and her head is on my right shoulder. I got as far as the kitchen when she made a weird noise, and I felt her stomach move. Frick. Vomit starts pouring out of her mouth, down my back, and all over the kitchen floor. Since it's falling from five feet in the air, it's also splattering up the walls. My wife is yelling at me to take our daughter to the bathroom, but that would spread the puke further. So for a good three minutes, I just stood in a puddle of vomit, letting it all come out and run down my back. When it was all out, I let my uncontaminated wife take my daughter to wipe her face and put her to bed. I stripped off, threw my clothes in the wash, and mopped the kitchen floor and walls in my underwear. As a daughter who pretty much did the same thing to my dad 48 years ago, thank you for being such a great dad. My 80-year-old father still tells people about the time I barfed all over him. Story 15. Had a party at a friend's house. His roommate is found passed out in the driveway. They take him to his room. He wakes up enough to get in bed, so we leave him with the trash can next to him. Before my car leaves, the DD sends someone to check that the roommate is okay. 
He comes back laughing and says he was breathing and he was naked. So I didn't check any closer than that. Next day, I go over to help clean up. There are about 50 tea candles all over the house. Roommate is sitting at the kitchen table looking like death. I ask, you okay? His response was, I crap. I ask, what's with all the candles? His response, no, I crap. I ask for details and he outlines the following tale of horror. This is as close to word for word as I can give. I woke up in a burrito of my own crap. I had to throw away all of my bedding. I got crap on the ceiling and the walls. I crap in all of my shoes. Oh yeah, and I opened my German textbook, poop in it. Then I put it back on the shelf. I have scrubbed my room clean, but the smell remains, so I bought 100 tea candles to mask the smell until I can air out the house. At this point, I was laughing so hard I couldn't breathe. It was almost a week before they stopped burning candles to hide the smell. Story 16. Say no more. That entire airport is a never-ending crap show, even on the best of days. A few years back, I walked into a nightclub bathroom to witness a rather inebriated patron leaning at a 45-degree angle against one of the urinals. I stepped up two urinals over, as courtesy dictates. Moments later, in my peripheral vision, it looks like this guy has either got a second wind, pulling some new dance moves, or is performing an exorcism. I guess it was the latter, as seconds later, he's vomiting like Linda Blair. Unfortunately, in his state, his dance moves are pure instinct, and he goes to cover his mouth midstream. He ends up peeing all over his jeans and shoes. He notices this, so he goes back to grab himself, but still in cover mouth mode, it ends up with him sort of cupping his hands around his crotch, so he's just catching most of his vomit around his member. I'm now looking at a guy clutching his stomach contents around his junk, then the flow starts again. It's like the saddest fountain in the world. The worst part was the look on the attendant's face. No amount of CK1 was sorting this out. I just imagine the room slowing down for the attendant with dramatic music in the background, while images flash between the ongoing poop show and flashbacks of his past, while thinking about what better things he could have done with his life to not be in that situation. Story 17. Alright, I'm probably wasting my time at this point, but here it goes. So it all happens one fateful day in elementary school. I was about 9 or 10 years old, and we are out playing soccer next to the fields because they would never let us little young shoots use it. Anyway, at one point, someone hits a speaker that was nearby with the ball, and we think, no biggie, it doesn't look like it got damaged or anything, so we continue to play. Finally, about 5 minutes later, recess is over, and they make everyone form lines in the playground so we can proceed to our classrooms. Weird school. And because we were about a thousand students or so, the process always took a while. While we were waiting there for our turn, out of nowhere comes a freaking swarm of bees and descends upon us like it's doomsday. What happened is that inside that old useless speaker lived a freaking swarm of bees, and they're all ticked off. Everybody in the schoolyard is getting stung and panics, so I bolt out of there and take refuge under a set of stairs, admiring the poop storm, or bee storm, unfolding before my very eyes. All I can tell you is that by the time it was all over, there was a huge line to the infirmary that went around the building. I wasn't stung. Story 18. My 21st birthday. A friend had invited another friend who was also having a birthday, and that no one else knew. She in turn brought a bunch of borderline white power skins and crust punks that no one had ever met before. They show up, break one of the host's crystal glasses her grandmother had left her, and try to steal the keg we had put a deposit on before trying to leave. We get the keg shell back, and when they're backing out, they hit my car. I go up to a dude to verify the insurance information in case there's damage, and the guy hauls off and punches me in the side of the head. Now I have a metal plate in my skull, so it didn't do much damage-wise, but it still rings my bell a little bit. A friend sees what happens and jumps into the fray. By the end of it, my friends were all fighting the other guys in what had turned into a 20-plus person brawl. It only ended when the host's boyfriend comes out with his shotgun, this is Texas, fires one shot into the air, and tells the strangers that they better get the F off the property before he buries them in the backyard. One of my fondest memories, although I don't hope to relive it. Story 19. My senior year of high school, I played the Beast slash Prince in Disney's Beauty and the Beast, 
In April in Northern California, it was considerably hot. Additionally, the mask I had was a teddy bear hood, complete with a pound of stage makeup. To keep from sweating off the makeup, the crew had rigged a semicircle of box fans backstage to keep me cool when I wasn't on. We get to the transformation in the final scene, and an electrical fire starts backstage. This triggers the fire alarm and onstage sprinklers, soaking the orchestra. Because we were poor, we just used a fog screen to hide the crew removing the makeup and mask. When the alarm went off, the fog guy dropped the fog machine and ran, leaving it pointing right at my south pole. I happened to scream, Frick, my dong! Just as the orchestra stopped playing. Also, I had to stumble downstairs with half of my makeup off and awkwardly ad-lib with the other soaked actors for about five minutes, while the director and staff silently tried to decide if they should move forward with the show. Needless to say, the orchestra picked up and the fire department showed up a few minutes later, and ever since, nothing on stage or screen has intimidated me. Story 20. Back in college, someone had apparently gotten a copy of the final from a TA accidentally and passed it around to some of their friends. What I mean accidentally was that the professor always had old tests and questions that you could ask to see to study and practice with, but apparently the old test ended up being the actual thing. Well, as you can imagine, that crap doesn't stay secret for long, and the whole thing blew up right after everyone had taken the exam and people realized what happened. The professor and the dean had to pull everyone in the course into a conference to discuss it because it was an exam that counted for so much of the grades, and so it wasn't like they could nullify the grade entirely or do a retest since it was finals week already. It was not the best decision to have an open forum because a lot of people started airing their grievances, with a lot of mudslinging going on too. In the end, I can't even remember what happened, but I think they ended up curving everyone's grade by a couple points since it was a no-win situation. No one intentionally tried to cheat per se, but an unfair advantage was given. Story 21. Every single case I deal with within the Coast Guard is generally a crap show. This July 3rd, I got a call at 1 in the morning about a 30-foot boat out of gas and we were sent searching for it. I had already been out for 6 hours, so I was tired. Find them 5 miles offshore flashing a flashlight, 7 people on the boat, one being a 16-year-old kid. One drunk guy is paddling with an oar, telling us if we have to charge them to tow them back in to just take the kids and woman and they will paddle 5 miles back. The man was obviously crap-faced. He then tried to stand up to grab something from the boat falling down, where we realized he had a broken and hurt ankle. The actual operator had a bucket of beer under the wheel, DUI slash BUI, so we make preps to tow them back in, and as we're towing them in, they decided to take shots. Get back, and the operator blows over the legal limit, but tries to argue that isn't fair because he wasn't operating when we came out, finding them paddle. Just a real crap show. I ended up out until 6 in the morning. Story 22. The captain of my first duty station in the Navy, a dock landing ship which shall not be named here, was relieved of his command and forced into retirement for running us aground off the coast of North Carolina. Just try to imagine a 632 foot long US Navy warship, hazy gray and underway, stuck on a sandbar. It was the poop show to end all poop shows. It took the tugs a full day to get us unstuck. And then we were in the yards for over a year repairing the damage to the screws, the main shafts, and the turning gears. The skipper was reportedly drunk on the bridge when it happened, and tried to pass the buck off onto the QM3, who was on duty with him. I was sleeping behind the EOS console in the main machinery room too when it happened. Between the violent lurch of the ship and resulting alien motionlessness, the sound, the console alarms, the GQ alarm, and the panic I woke up to, I thought I was going to have my life ended. In the end, it was just embarrassing. The Navy Times had a hard time getting a quote from anyone in the command regarding the incident. Story 23. I was at a party once on an island with a group of friends when another group of guys came. They were all bigger and older and drunk before they got there. They kept disrespecting us and the owner's house, and we ended up getting into a brawl with them in the driveway. Even though they were all bigger, they used rocks and bottles. My friend got a croquet mallet and hit a dude full force in the forehead. I will never forget the sound it made, and everyone just stopped fighting. One of the girls started screaming, Oh my god, his life is over! It's over! And all the rest of them started to cry and ran into the house. Cops and EMS came, 
Cops arrested my friend on attempted red rum, and EMS took the downed guy to a helicopter pad to get immediate attention from the hospital. Turns out the guy had a fractured skull and bleeding from the brain, and the only reason he wasn't a veggie was because of the helicopter. The DA dropped the charges against my friend, citing self-defense. Freaking Martha's Vineyard fights are no joke. Story 24. When I was 15, I obtained a PDF version of an anarchist cookbook. Made a few things at first, then decided to go big and make some homemade plastic explosives. Made about 10 to 20 pounds of it, 25 to 50 percent of military grade, if that. Went to a cement factory with a big yard, pulled the porta potty into the center of the yard, installed our homemade blasting cap, and ran to a safe distance. Five, four, three. Hey, what are you kids doing? Two, one, boom and it literally rained crap for 5 to 10 seconds. The security guard who just yelled at us wiped his eyes clean and proceeded to inform us of how much trouble we were in. Three days later, we were woken up at 4 a.m. by two huge Samoan guys on either side of my bed. They then escort me to RTC slash military school in Utah. Story 25. We had a tequila night at my friend's lake house, and needless to say, all five of us hot got hammered. Well, as I was coming out of my blackout holding a door, I ripped off the wall to the bathroom. I noticed everyone drinking out of the sink, desperate to sober up. I was too drunk to make it over to the sink, so I just sat down and passed out. When I woke up, literally everyone was projectile vomiting. Turns out the tap drew from the gnarly lake water. I just remember looking around, part hungover, part drunk, part lifeless, at everyone looking like the scene from The Exorcist, and just thinking, frick, and passing out. Story 26. Well, we were at Chili's for lunch, and this teenager was apparently on a first date with a girl. He mentioned it to the waiter about 15 times, and he was seriously being so horrible. We were just creeping and hearing his crap. The crap was as follows. Interrupted her every time she spoke, started playing Pokemon Go and telling her she was dumb for not playing, sprawled himself out in the booth and was lying down, tried and failed hitting on the waitress, mentioned that college is for nerds, was wearing a wife beater, and definitely skipped all arm and leg days. It was horrible. That must be the worst attempt at being the bad boy. Story 27. Walking back to my car one night after a performance, I heard shouting from the nearby parking lot. As it turns out, several drunk guys had locked the keys in their car, and one equally smashed girlfriend was screaming at them because they were idiots. Then she grabbed a rock and smashed the window of this very expensive-looking car. All of them started screaming, and just then, campus police showed up, and I left. I later found out from a friend who worked with campus police that all of them were so drunk, they were at the wrong vehicle, and as such, had to pay for the damages. Story 28. In college, some guys all took poops in the same toilet, and then put a huge firework in it and exploded the toilet. We saw them running out of the toilets and up the corridor, laughing. Then, shortly afterwards, heard this almighty bang. A couple of others and I went in to see what the F happened. Literal poop show. I'd hate to be the last one to crap. Story 29. I once witnessed two opposing groups of drunk men fighting at 1pm in the middle of the street. The fight was then successfully broken up by a dude who came out of nowhere, who was dressed up as Ronald McDonald's. I often lay up nights thinking of what could possibly have been the context. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.